welcome back everybody to episode 83 of the Rubby Muscle Podcast. In today's episode, we are going to be talking how to train, the training principles and basics that apply to every athlete and human. The reason that we're doing this is not to sort of accommodate everybody that is training. It's actually to make sure that you understand exactly how to get the most out of your training, why you don't necessarily have to do the Olympic lifts, but why you can, why you don't necessarily have to train uh, between three to five reps or in the hypertrophy range, but you can. And understanding this principled thinking will help shape all of your training in the future, or at least get you to understand how training really works. There's nothing magic, there's nothing, uh, there's no Russian or Chinese or Bulgarian secrets to training. There are just principles that you can either adhere to and get the best results or ignore and, you know, still kind of get results but not get anything perfect. Once again, I am joined by big Nick Whiteman, my other coach here at TJ Strength. And this show is sponsored by rugby-muscle.com where you can go and visit to pick up any of our three free products or all three. And those are the 50 free conditioning sessions, the physique nutrition crash course video series and the Tuesday strength supplement guide. You can find them all over there at rugby-muscle.com. You'll also receive emails if you sign up for any of these free guides. And they're not the typical spammy emails constantly trying to sell you stuff. I actually really pride myself on giving you guys the best information with these emails. I don't want to use and abuse you. I want to give you the best information that I can. And every time I send an email, I get a bunch of replies saying how much value guys found from it and how often people actually look forward to seeing my emails hit their inbox because they know they're going to get some good information that they can understand uh, and use. And on top of that, for the next few weeks, whilst we are relaunching the Rugby Muscle podcast, we are letting you in uh, on in some information how you can win some free memberships to receive the training and workouts as part of Team Rugby Muscle. But that's only going on for the next few weeks. So uh, if you're going to go ahead and get yourself a free guide, might as well do it right now and you can get some information how you can win cutting edge training delivered right to your phone for free. But for right now, guys, we'll get into the podcast, the training, basics, and why you need to use them. All right, so we are back here with Nick again. And last time we spoke about all the different nutrition basics and the principles that we have to do in order to succeed with our diet. And this time, we're going to be doing the same thing, but this time we're going to be going over um, the training principles and why the training principles and the training basics are what matters rather than random shitty workouts. How are you going, Nick? Yeah, yeah, good, man, good. Um, I've given you about 30 seconds to prepare for this, but in the last podcast, I remembered that we did not do the fact of the week, and I promised in our return podcast that we would continue doing this because it's probably the most requested part of the podcast. So yeah, so uh, I had a hold on. About it. Yes. All right. Now it's time for fact of the week. Yeah, yeah. So I had a quick think, um, and it's something I saw on social media a few times in the last week. So some people might already know, but uh, and, and it might trigger some vegans. But avocados technically not vegan, um, and the reason for that is essentially the same reason why honey isn't vegan. Oh yeah, uh, I posted this in my story. Migratory yeah. beekeeping to pollinate avocado crops, um, and therefore true vegans or vegans to that level shouldn't be eating things like avocados. And there's a bunch of other fruits and vegetables that fall into the same category. Huh. So does that mean that like, can you have, um, so you can't even eat like anything that's been, that requires bees? Uh, it's not the, re- the, qui- the requirement of bees. It's the migratory beekeeping where they, uh, move more hives into the area so that they can pollinate enough to so yield farming. enough crops to feed the demand. Huh. So a, a natural avocado, that's fine. Yeah, like but an organic an avocado. avocado. you buy from the shops, not fine. Did you know that a natural avocado is about, it must be at least a quarter of the size of a commercial bought one? Yeah, and it's and the seed is so much of it as well. Yeah, it's most of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's it's why it's always funny when people uh, have avocados on their paleo diet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The fuckers wouldn't have eaten this normal. But anyway, this is not what we're supposed to be talking about today. Today, 
we I mean we already overrun the last podcast. So today we're going to be talking about um, the training principles, the mm-hmm. training basics, why we need to consider doing those instead of um, you know, well why we need to consider that those are the most important things rather than trying like random, really really random polycon workouts or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so rather than like like we already spoke about why given why, why um, principles are more important than anything else and why all of the basics are, are really important. So we're just going to get straight into them mm-hmm. and sort of outline what the idea is, here is. So, oh, what's that notification? So the first one is the principle of specificity. You want to get into that, mate, and uh, we'll expand upon it? Yeah, so specificity is talking about stuff that is very specific to your sport. Um, and... So, for example, if you're a hurdler, it's jumping over the hurdle is very specific to your sport, whereas less specific or not uh, adhering to specificity would be something like, I know, squatting in the gym. So, as a rugby player, the specificity is going to be running with ball in hand, passing, like these things you do playing, during the game. Playing rugby. Yeah, playing rugby. And, um, you know, specificity, you can you, there's levels of it. And yeah. so, maybe a you know, single-legged squat is more specific to rugby than a double-legged squat if you're a back especially. Um, Beautiful. And, and you work your way down to, you know, probably a hinge, not that, like a deadlift, not that specific, but it does have very good carryover. Yeah. Um, the, way, the way I like to talk about, I mean, and all of these principles, you can sort of apply it, that there's a spectrum rather than black or white. It's all a spectrum. So, you know, on the spectrum of specificity for improving your you, yourself as a rugby player right being just playing rugby is going to be a 10 out of 10 specificity it's the most specific exactly. thing that you can do um towards your sport mm-hmm. um sleeping would be a zero right and then lifting weights in general regardless of how how much you're trying to imitate a movement yep. is going to fall somewhere you know between like a five and an eight or something you know it's, yeah it definitely is going to bring about uh improvement but it's not necessarily specific no um, um and i guess that's uh where strength and condition comes into it it's, it's general preparedness um but it's not that specific to your sport really yeah so you, you know um all of uh, unless your sport that you're trying to improve on is weightlifting powerlifting and i guess crossfit yeah crossfit um, is just a sport of strength, strength and conditioning yeah but other than that like everything that you do in the gym isn't going to be specific. It's going to be general prep pretty much. Exactly. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because um, you're, you know, cause then we can, we can break down specificity even further and say, right, for me to improve as a rugby player, I've got to get stronger. So now the specificity applies to strength as opposed to being a better rugby player, because we know that getting stronger is going to make you a better rugby player in turn. Exactly. Um, and, 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 and whatever your goal is uh, as that rugby player, so if it's to get stronger, then you obviously need to spend more time, you know, doing compound lifts between 80 and 100% of your 1RM, uh, 1 to 5 reps a set, less than 25 reps a session sort of thing. Um, but your goal might not necessarily be to get stronger. It might be to get faster. So then you need to work more in the speed and speed strength uh, area. So you might be lifting between... 10 and 10%, uh, sorry, 10 and 30% of your 1RM uh, doing things like explosive throws and jump squats, um, you know, jumps, five to 10 reps a set, less than 40 reps a session sort of thing. And then even going further with no load uh, and looking at plyometrics and ballistic movements. Yeah. And as I said, it's all going to depend on what you as an individual player need to specify on to get better. Yeah. And like, um specific like i say specificity doesn't just apply to the sport or whatever it's it's about um how you can really dig into the adaptation that you want it's not it's not necessarily just um it's not necessarily just a sport or just this one thing like uh you know the word functional is always thrown about but the fuck does functional even mean yeah well and functional is different for whatever function you're trying to do like you know there's functional exercises that help you sit at your desk all day. There's functional exercises that help you do handstands. Like, right. But if you don't need them, they're not functional. 
So th- this is where we can go into things like people when people do shit on a BOSU ball, like, and they'll just put hashtag functional. Well, when we look at specificity, like how is that going to specifically help us on a rugby pitch? Do we ever play on an unbalanced field on, on when we play rugby? No. no. So Unless you're that like violates specificity. surfing, yeah. something like that. The BOSU ball is good for rehab and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because it violates the term, you know, it violates the principle of specificity. Because yeah. uh, if we're going to train for our specific needs, we don't need to be on a wobbly ground. Exactly. Um, and then the last little thing I will touch on here is that again, it's really important to you're not just trying to match what you want or what that what you, the thing that you're trying to improve upon looks like. So a really good example here is when you see people that say, "Oh yeah, I'm doing specific scrum work." And, you know, they do things where their hands are on the floor. Well, already by that, by then, you're, it's not specific to, it, it looks like a scrum or it looks like a ruck in position. But if you, if you have your hands on the floor in a scrum or a ruck, you're going to give away a penalty. And therefore, yeah. you're, you're not training the same pattern. You're training a pattern that looks similar. But really, yeah. when you look at the specificity of how the muscles are working, how your body is moving, it's completely different. So don't fall into that trap. Yeah, and it, as you said, it, it's it's on a scale. Um, so yeah, if it looks like a scrum position or a rock position, but maybe your hands are on the ground, then maybe you're at like a six or seven out of ten. But it's not the same as scrumming. Yeah. So essentially, what this means is, or what specific specificity means, is that we're just trying to um, do the things that help us get to our goal. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not gonna. Tr- if I want to be a better scr- uh, scrummager, and I'm a front row player, then going to doing a I don't know, doing a Zumba class, for example, is probably not gonna help me. Unless no. the the only way that could be is because I wanted to move and burn some calories and I wanted to lose some weight. Like yeah, or you just like dancing to sweet Latin music. And that I don't, I don't. <laughs> but but that's how. That's how we can look at these things as a spectrum as opposed to black and white, yes or no. Exactly, yeah. Sweet. Let's move on. Overload. Uh, yeah, so uh, overload, um, or, or also known as progressive overload, is making sure that each time you go into the gym and you train the same movement pattern, you are progressing uh, either heavier, uh, more reps, more sets, less rest time, like something to make it harder each session so that you are progressing in a positive direction. Beautiful. Yeah. So essentially you're just doing, um, you're just doing a little bit more each time, yeah. giving yourself that much more of a challenge, you know, um, you know, start in, you know, to be really scientific, we could just say the stimulus is on average greater than the recent historical stimuli. Essentially exactly. saying that you are doing a little bit more than you did before. Um, Mm -hmm. why are we doing that mate um, it's literally just to keep progressing Uh, if you go into the gym and you bench press 100 kilos for 10 reps and you do that again the next week the next week the next week you're just going to get really good at bench pressing 100 kilos for 10 reps yeah you're probably not going to get that much stronger like your one rep max probably won't get much stronger you're you know obviously if whatever your specificity stuff is has nothing to do with bench pressing then it's going to you know, it'll help your ego and that's about it. Yeah. Um, if for example, to get that one rep max up, you're going to need to start trying to bench press 105 kilos for 10 reps or, you know, uh, hundred kilos for 11 reps or 12 reps. And you have to go, you have to increase the workload in volume or intensity or decrease the rest to try and make it harder each time so that you can actually progress. Cause if you just keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same result. Yeah. You've got to do just a little bit more in it. And, and, you know, it's it's if you think about it, that's exactly what you do when you go to school. You start in year yeah. one, you learn some basic shit, and then you expand and you do, you challenge your brain harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. It's mm-hmm. the exact same thing with the body. You, you just got to do a little bit more each time to get that much better. And and like that's we can even we can see that, and it doesn't have to be like oh week one ten reps, week two twelve reps, etc. It can be really subtle. Um, things to overload on for example if you just had a game of rugby if you just played rugby every single week there is a chance that you could overload you could still adhere to the principle of overload by just doing more work every single game 
Yeah, and, and if you had a way of tracking that, um, yeah. you know, obviously you'd be able to set yourself goals for the game. Like, say, for example, somebody was tracking your tackles for the game, you made 10 tackles in game one, then overload still works if you make 11 games in game, uh, sorry, 11 tackles in game two. Beautiful, yeah. But at the same time, most people aren't going to be able to measure that, so that's what makes it very difficult in, like, just to play rugby games and say, oh, I'm going to get better, but you don't know that for sure. No, and that's why um, the training off the field needs to be tracked so that you can yeah. track something and ensure you're progressing in some way, and there's no doubt that that will translate onto the field. Yeah, that's why we write down the reps. Like, oh, I got eight reps on this last time. Oh, I got ten reps on this time. That means I've, I've, you know, I've adhered to, I've adhered to overload. Exactly. And to go back to specificity. You've also that's also a great way to make sure that you're doing the same thing to get that overload because I couldn't just go, you know, I couldn't just switch bench press variations every single time and ensure that I'm overloading myself because I have to be specific to make sure I'm doing that. No, and if you've ever tried to bench press and then just halve the weight and grab two dumbbells and dumbbell press, it just doesn't work. Like, <laughs> no. you, you can't overload without repeating uh, the effort. Yeah, or and 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 it's also um, I'm going to go into a tangent, but fuck it, we'll do it. Um, it's also why it's like one of the best reasons that we use that free weights are better than machines because it's a lot easier to measure that. Because if you go to I don't know if you go to different gyms or if a gym get or if a you go to the same gym but the equipment isn't very well maintained and then one week it gets maintained, like those the weights on, and even from machine to machine. Like the weights on the, the cam loaded or the cables, they vary quite a lot. And it's very difficult to figure out, oh, am I, am I getting an overload compared to what I did last week? You, you, yeah. you don't really know. And you can't just go in with the mentality of, oh, I'm just going to push it until you know, I, I fail or I push it until it gets really hard or whatever. Because how you feel often is a lie. Like if I'm, yeah. if I'm super well rested and I do um, – yeah, you know, I match and I and I match my reps from last week when I was really, 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 really tired. That will be a piece of piss for me. Whereas just to beat it by one rep, if I'm really tired and I was well rested last week, that's going to push me. But I should still be able to do it. Yeah, and this is why. Um, and I use RPE and reps in reserve when I program for people, but it's a hard way to measure overload because RPE, rate of perceived exertion, as you said, when you're fucked, is going to you know, a 10 RPE might be like a seven RPE when you're uh, uh, fresh of the days, you know? And so when people talk about that reps in reserve and there's recent, um, I'm not sure if it was a study or it was just some of the big dogs talking about hypertrophy, talking about working up to three, two, one reps in reserve, like mm -hmm. to get that response and to make sure you're overloading, you need to make sure that you are in the exact same condition each time doing that. And that's a hard thing to do. So I prefer to work on things like a uh, percentage of your one RM where it's far more like accurate and, and something measurable. Yeah. I tend to just try and get the increase without the R, RP or RIR, but yeah. if it happens then it's even better, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. Really good point, mate. Really good point. And, and, and uh, this overload, can go for anything it can go for sprinting and it can and, and, and i mentioned in the previous season of the rugby muscle podcast where you know overload doesn't necessarily have to be more weight it can actually be and i think you mentioned it already like it can be less weight so if you're doing power stuff your specificity requires you to do things faster and faster and faster and faster mm -hmm. so that would mean less and less and less weight but that still gives you overload because you're you're working those muscles and you're taxing those systems in a better way yeah, like if you can, like, and, and there are ways to measure it, but not many people have access to them. But if you can move the bar faster with, you know, a slightly less weight or even the same weight, then you are progressively overloading. Yeah. I just, I just try not to mention things that require special equipment and stuff to measure. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's, it's really simple, but that's why it's, you've, it's so important for you to log your workouts, track, your, track as much as you can. Yeah. Because what gets measured, we can then make sure it gets overloaded and gets managed well. Exactly. Sweet. Um, and so, already from from these two from these two principles, we can sort of again explain in a way how some programs are really good and some aren't so good, or some work really well for people in certain situations. But 
in general aren't really great programs. And Yeah, like uh, any program will look awesome if you get a newbie doing it. Like somebody who's relatively new to training, um, they're going to look amazing on any program, whether it's good or shit. Like just doing something is going to be good for them. Yeah, I just thought of the perfect example is that we're in Squatoba, right? So yeah. so many motherfuckers, I don't know, like I'm not hating on it, but everyone is um, deciding they're going to squat every day for the most part for October or at least six you days a week or do high frequency squatting. And yeah. if your goal is you want to get a better squat, then there's nothing more specific than training the squat a shit ton. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as long as, he's, as long as you're overloading the muscle each each time you do it or week to week because it wouldn't because sometimes you're going to just do recovery squat days it doesn't necessarily overload doesn't necessarily mean that you have to improve every single session but the general theme is an upward trend exactly um and and uh who's doing it at the moment the guys at kabuki strength are doing they're lifting 880 pounds they're lifting 880 pounds every day uh, in october and they're measuring bar speed to see how their fatigue is yeah um and using the relative fatigue and that sort of thing to work out if they're uh, actually progressing. And actually when, uh, I think it's, um, is it Duffy? Chris Duffy or something like that? Duffin. Um, the, the guy who owns it, um, yep. he got to the point where he was getting too fatigued and couldn't maintain it. So other people in the team started taking over those deadlifts. And, you know, it's just another way of, of measuring that and, and making sure that, you know, in this case, you're not fatiguing, but in other cases that you are progressing. But here we go. So he was being specific as he could, but then he realized that he, because of the amount, uh, because of his training frequency, he couldn't overload in the long term. So therefore, he oh, couldn't improve, right? Yeah. With, with all these big compound moves, if you try and do it every day and you don't have somebody or yourself, um, you know, looking at the intensity, you kind of end up with an injury. It's almost guaranteed. Uh, and, and this brings us beautifully beautifully onto our third principle that we wanted to talk about, which is um, fatigue management. Mm -hmm. So essentially um, fatigue in general is actually, everyone thinks it's a terrible thing. Like everyone looks for recovery. How can I recover? How can I recover? Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the SRA curve, we've got to understand that fatigue is actually a good thing because we have yeah. to fatigue ourselves in order to come back and improve. Exactly. Um, and on, on that topic, we just, talking about that overload is going to lead to some fatigue but without the overload there's no progress and therefore without the fatigue there's no progress um and so that initial stimulus is um what is going to overload is what's going to fatigue us and we need to recover and adapt to that um in in order to progress the next time so there's a couple of ways to look at this. So if you're talking about in the gym, I find the best way to look at uh, recovery and fatigue management is using the Renaissance periodization method of the uh, minimum effective volume, uh, maximum recoverable. adaptive volume, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, maximum recoverable volume and um, the average volume or something like that. Um, basically, they have these volume landmarks where they look at the minimum amount of frequency you need for a muscle group per week uh -huh. for it to either stay the same or grow. And then the maximum recoverable volume for a muscle group per week before you can't then overload the next week um, or the next session, like depending on what your mesocycle looks like. Um, and essentially it, they talk about how it's different for everybody uh, and it's something yeah. you need to find out for yourself, but it's roughly – uh, 20 sets a week per muscle group. It's obviously different for everything. And if you, and if somebody is interested in looking all the way into it, the Renaissance periodization site has all the muscle groups break broken down. Yeah. Um, but in the gym, I find that's the best explanation for it. You know, there's a minimum amount of work you need to do uh, to maintain what you have or grow a little bit more. And then there's a maximum amount you can do and still go back and overload the next week. Yeah, because that's the important thing is that we got to go back up and see, hey, can we can we improve? It's not just about beating last week. It's about beating last week, but giving yourself enough room or enough recovery so that you can then beat it again next week. That's why exactly. um, and, people always and ask me about German volume training. Sorry, mate. 
No, uh, you're exactly saying the same point as that. The German volume training and the yeah. uh, these things like squat turbo and that sort of thing, like eventually they're going to get to a point where they're not recovering and not able to perform at the same level. And that progressive overload that we already spoke about isn't going to be adhered to and they're not going to actually gain anything from the work they're putting in. Yeah. And you've got um, you just got to really understand that uh, – like you, you want to continue to get better. It's not just about this one week. It's not just about this microcosm. Yeah. And Mate, so- when I put speed reps into people's programs, they freak out. They're like, why am I lifting it so light? It's easy. Why is it so few reps? It's like, it's too easy. I don't feel like it's doing anything. I'm like, well, you're practicing that movement pattern, but you're not fatiguing yourself. Like, I'll give guys speed reps on a Friday before a game on a Saturday. Yeah. And... Some people are like, oh, no, you, I'm, I can't squat the day before a game. I'm like, trust me, this is how it works. Yeah. And, and some people are like, oh, it's a waste of my time. Why am I, am I squatting at 60%? You know, it's, it's, it's not something that I'm going to get any benefit from. And then they go and play on the weekend, and they're like, fuck, I felt awesome today. Everything was firing, you know, because I gave them some specific exercises to work on proprioception before a game. And it's yeah. stuff that people don't think about. And, and it's not just the – recovery aspect but it's also the preparation aspect that's going to help the recovery afterwards yeah and it essentially like with with like a lot of those workouts all you're really doing is practicing the technique so that mm-hmm. it means that you know it's easier to overload the in future weeks because you can get every as each week goes by you get better technique therefore yeah. you can handle more weight but it's also about getting blood flow into those muscles which mm. uh, helps them recover Definitely. So um, the way I like to do it, and you know, everyone's different, but I like to go for like a hypertrophy style program within one or two days of a game of rugby uh, to sort of flush everything out, you know, get new blood going in and out. Yep. Um, I'll go a strength style session during the week and then a speed style session towards the end of the week. Um, and depending on the body part, obviously I can mix those around because there's some things, for certain sports that, you know, you don't use in the game as much as you could. Or, like, for example, some people like playing rugby with a bit of a, you know, pump on from the Friday night. Yeah, they like know, to feel those a bit of hypertrophy, upper body, <laughs> and now they feel a bit bigger, a bit more confident. Yeah. For sure. And and then, again, we've still ticked the boxer's specificity because that's what that player wants to do to require yeah. them to be a better player. Exactly. And, yeah, I'm really happy with that, mate. Um what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it there and we're going to go into uh, variation um, and a bunch of other like more, how, how would I say, more advanced principles, I guess, mm-hmm. um, of training. And we're going to go into that in the next episode. Perfect, mate. All right, guys, thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode or if you've enjoyed any episode of the Robbie Muscle Podcast, please go ahead and give us a five-star rating and type a quick review. It takes about a minute and it really helps us out a ton, helps grow the show, helps grow Rugby Muscle. And in turn, we will be able to give you guys the best quality content, information and programs that we possibly can. If you're interested in any of that stuff, like the free physique nutrition video series or the TJ Strength Supplement Guide or the 50 free rugby conditioning sessions, you can find them all at rugby-muscle.com or by going through my Instagram profile at tj.strength. Give me a quick follow. And until next time, guys, I've been your host as always, TJ. See you soon.